So. Hi everybody, I'm Richard Michael Owen. This is my dad, Mike Owen. We're working on this 1957 Jaguar Fixed Head Coupe. Welcome to episode nine. Let's get into it. Look at that everybody, back on the XK150, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I just love this body and paint. But for this episode, we're gonna be focusing on the engine. It's right there on the stand. It just came back from the machine shop and I've spent a long time cleaning it up and getting ready for this process. Pretty excited to put it together. So what do we got here? This is a standard 3.4 liter Jaguar block, about 210 horsepower. It's the same engine actually from the XK140 and the saloons used it as well. So at the machine shop, they decked the block here, just making a nice new clean surface for that cylinder head gasket, that multi-layer steel cylinder head gasket. And you can still see the stampings here for the grade of the bore. So they took off very, very little material, just enough to true it up. Doesn't it look so fabulous? Now the bores, they've been punched out 20 thou over, but it's not just 20 thou over. My machinist, Rob, he measured the, the diameter of the pistons and bores it according to the hardware going in, and that's pretty important. So our machine shop here is Mid-Island Machine. We really trust them. And you know, they're not the only guys in town. Everybody probably has a very local and reputable machine shop that you can use, which is nice, because these are really heavy units, hard to move. But for us, Mid-Island is the choice. Chuck and Rob, thank you so much. All these parts are looking really good. Oh yeah, look at this, everybody. This crankshaft, it was ground as well, 20 thou under. This is a work of art. I really do love this kind of stuff, seeing these fresh new steel surfaces. So this crankshaft is an EN16 forged crank. It's extremely heavy and counterweighted. And so it has to be balanced after it's all done up. We took out the sludge plugs. See, they're in there, so we're gonna have to make a note to put those back in. I can see Mid Island here. They actually put their own marks on here to reference this build. And yeah, the machining's just beautiful. See the radius here on the journal? Uh, yeah, real work of art. I think if I wasn't doing this, I'd really like to try my hand at machining, that's for sure. Wow, look at that. Okay, so at the bottom here, the scroll, the oil seal scroll's been ground off. And we did that to put on this modern seal. And it's a split seal. And uh, that replaces this scroll, which is an old antiquated design and hopefully sealing the oil a lot better. Now we have the seven main caps here, some pretty weighty main caps. So I was talking to Rob and he rehoned the main journals. And how does he do that? Well, he takes off a bit of material off each main cap, actually five thousandths. Then he reattaches them to the block and hones them all to an exact size. And that's important. So he measured the main bearings and he figured out a number that was the best suited for this crank, his grind, and these main caps. And that's how he ascertains how much material to take off. Ready for some action. Time to put this crankshaft in. So one consideration was this new rear main seal. I'll show you what that looks like. Now this uses a split neoprene seal that's pre-fitted to the crankshaft here. You can see it fitted on here. The spring unwinds and the neoprene seal is actually cut into two so it can go around the flange for the flywheel. So we got the bearings ready on the block with assembly lube and we have half of that spring seal conversion sitting right here. Uh, we're ready to drop this thing in. So we're gonna have to watch the angle of that seal, make sure it's not in line with the retainer. How's it look? Okay, going to put the other half of the retainer in. A little bit of silicone here on the ends and where the neoprene seal sits. Go 
Next up, I wanna put the center main bearing cap in for good reason, because it has the thrust washers on here. Have to make sure the grooves are on the outside, otherwise it'll screw up the crankshaft. And a couple other things, just make sure that my dowel bolts are both in place and that I'm numbered. These are all numbered and they go on only one way. The stampings are all together. Okay, so these oversized thrust bearings actually aren't gonna fit. So I'm gonna go a step down on one of them and see how it goes from there. Okay, let's try one size down. And I'm doing the one size down on the front one because the rear one takes all the load from the clutch. There, that goes in there a lot better. So likely gonna have the correct end float. Okay, gonna torque it down just lightly. Then we can measure the end float. Well, just prying it back and forth here so you can't see it. I only got about half a thou, which isn't enough. So I'm gonna try some different thrust washers in there and see if we get a better amount of play. Okay, let's see how these ones work. Let's test the movement out now. Oh, looks good about four thou. So now with the correct end float, we can put on the rest of the main caps. I put them on in order because they're numbered. That just helps to keep everything all in the right spot. Now, if we were to move these main caps around, likely the crankshaft would not turn freely. And that's what we're looking for here. We want this crank to turn freely after it's all done. So what am I doing here? Just putting a little bit of lube down where those bolt heads are. I'm going to lube those threads just to try to get a really accurate torque rating. Now one thing I forgot to mention too is that when I put them on, I check the dowels because the dowels can fall off in the main cap or on the block and they have to be on to locate these things precisely. So you're just putting these bolts down, not putting on the original lock tabs that we don't put soft metal in the inside motors anymore. We just rely on the bolt stretch. So yeah, just doing my preliminary 50 pounds on each one. Then I'll come back on a second pass, bring it to the prescribed 83 foot pounds. Here I am just in real time, 83 foot pounds. Then after this, I double checked each one and you know, some people like to put a little dot of paint on to signify that they've torqued them all down. For me, I just made the video and rewatched it, so I know all these are 83 foot pounds. Moment of truth. Oh, yeah, look at that. Freely rotating. Congratulations, uh, Rob of Mid Island. Look at that. It's free. Now, what's nice about using the, ne the neoprene seal versus the rope seal is you can test this right away. The rope seal tends to lock it in place and cause a lot of drag. So yeah, a bit of a benefit for using that seal conversion on the end. Okay, next up I want to put in the sludge plugs. I find it easier just to install them while the crankshaft's nice and supported in the block here. And these plugs have to go in. They were an original drilling that helped the oil go from the main bearing to the rod bearing here. And it's important that these things are in there and they're in there securely. So it's going in with some red Loctite and then we're going to peen them over. Really happy with the progress. Got that crankshaft fully supported in the block now. And that lets us move on to the connecting rods and pistons here on the bench. There's a lot to talk about, a lot of new parts and a lot of machining here. Having a look at the connecting rod here, a little bit of material taken off the cap on the big end and a little bit more material taken off the small end here at the top. That makes sure it's balanced and that all six connecting rods are the exact same weight. That's work done at the machine shop. Now at the big end here, we have new ARP bolts. That's pretty standard fare. And then Rob at Mid-Island Machine, he took a little bit of material off the rod and the cap, two thou off of each surface here, clamped it together and re-honed it to the perfect dimension at the big end. Got the new bearings there, new 8.0 pistons, 
the one thing I have to do is put the gudgeon pin in. Now, also Mid-Island, they also, I don't know if you can see it here, but they uh, line honed the gudgeon hole in the piston so that that will be totally free. So I gotta assemble these together and we'll put them on the block. Got the pistons all assembled, ready to go in the block. And one thing I needed to do was make sure that my split rings here are really well seated in the groove. So the gudgeon pins are nice and secure. Put them in with some assembly lube as well. Now the method to install these on the block is with a ring compressor here. So this is what you're gonna see going on to the block. This just compresses the rings as it goes down into the cylinder wall. And I have protective sleeves on the connecting rod bolts here. So it doesn't mar the cylinder wall or the journals themselves. Okay, the first thing I wanna do is put a little bit of light oil down the cylinder walls just to help the piston travel down and up. So I'm just gonna put a little light oil in this cylinder wall here. There we go. I'll just grab piston number one, essentially it's connecting rod number one with the stamp here. And I like to put the stamp on the exhaust side before we put this in, I'm going to put a little assembly lube, you better believe it, on the bearing here. One thing I should mention too is that, of course, when I put the um, piston, oh, this is goopy, into the compressor there, the compression ring, I made sure all the rings were staggered, none of them were lined up. Okay, so, just be very careful. Right down into the cylinder wall here. In goes the piston. Make sure that we're seated here. And we're gonna start receiving it here. So some light taps. There we are, it's in. Okay, flipped over the motor. Now we can fasten the rod to the crankshaft. Now we're using ARP connecting rod bolts. They have a different specification, a different lube here to put on the threads. So I'm gonna put it together according to what ARP says. So we're gonna put some lube on the threads. Stuff can get messy. A little bit of lube on the nut shoulder. Pull a focus there. So ARP want these torqued to 45 foot pounds for a 3 8 inch rod bolt. So that's what we're gonna do. Forty-five. Forty-five. Make sure it's still is freely moving. Yep, look at that. Great, hasn't locked up. Gonna finish off by marking them. These ones are tight. All done. Making lots of progress here. You can see the oil pump up top. It's driven in tandem with the distributor drive. I had to make sure that was clocked correctly so the distributor rotor will be in the right spot. New distance tube for the oil seal. New sprocket for the timing chain. Now this oil pump caught me off guard a little bit. It's a later type and the pickup tube is a bigger diameter. So I need to sleeve our existing pickup tube so it'll fit this modern and a, a better, really a better oil pump. So I don't mind doing that. So I want to move on to the timing chains and the sprockets. Just talk about the chains themselves. These are the upgraded ones from Iwis. I think that's German. I just verified they're the right length with the old one. That's a good habit to get into. Now the sprockets, I'm replacing all the sprockets here that drive the chains. The way they wear is they wear on the side of the tooth and we can see a ridge on it. I don't know if it's going to show up right away. But I don't know, there's a little bit of a ridge there. That's how you know when they start to get worn, when they're digging into the side of the tooth. When there's a ridge there, that's no good. Unfortunately, one of my 
One of my cam sprockets here is no good. I cannot get the assembly to click in. I'll show you what I mean. So I gotta get another one of those. Slightly frustrating, but hey, we're working on old cars. The guides here, these are very, very nice guides. I got them from Rob Beer Racing because the cheap ones are known to fail pretty quickly. So I went for the expensive ones from Rob Beer Racing. And that's it. I can't really put this together until I get a new cam sprocket. So in the meanwhile, let's find something else to do. Next up, I wanna deal with the front end lighting here. And I have to talk about the headlight pods, also known as the nacelles. This is a steel bodied pod that from the factory was spot welded all the way around and then let it in. It's a real beautiful shape. I just love it, but it's a constant source of corrosion on the XKs because what they did is they took on moisture. People would wash the cars. Moisture would end up in the bottom of the pod with nowhere to go, and it would just have a pool of water in here, rotting away the unprotected metal, especially the metal sandwich from the fender to the pod. So to alleviate that, I know this is kind of controversial. I drilled a small little hole at the very lowest point in the pod, and then I ran sealer all in there. I ran epoxy and urethane paint in there until it drained through. And I think that's gonna help in perpetuity. And for the third layer of protection, I'm gonna work with this cavity protection spray gun I just got. And we're gonna run that all through and try to get it deep into the metal sandwich that runs all the way up. We're real ways up the fender there and also in the side light telltale repeater. Now that I got that pod full of some cavity protection spray, I can put the light in. We can see the original unit here. It had the chrome that was kind of pressed around the housing and the glass. And there's just no way to renew this. It's just an unrestorable piece just in the way it was manufactured. So luckily I was able to find some pretty high quality reproductions. I know the end is slightly different, so I'll have to modify the harness and put a bullet on there. But I think these are gonna work. It seals in an O-ring and then it attaches just with this top mounted screw. I'll show you how it goes on. Okay, I got the light hooked up here. Dad, I'm gonna to try to install this. Okay. Oh yeah. It's a B8 thread. It's, okay, that's great, thanks. It's not in all the way though. Yeah. With those side lights in, can focus on the headlight now. Now unlike the XK120, 140, the 150 has these traditional pods. I don't really know how necessary they are because really this pod here area protected the headlight well enough. But here we go, we're putting these pods in. These are the second time that these are going on the car. I'll show you the first time I had to mount them to get these spears mounted just in the right location. And I know some of you will be very unhappy to know that I put a little dab of silicone around each hole to stop the water ingress. Let's get this on the car. Now, I haven't got the bulbs in yet, but I want to show you the lights we're going to put on this baby. Look at these beautiful J lamps. They call them a J lamp because they have the small insignia there in the center. These are replicas made by Lucas. I think it's a way to go. Old originals are very expensive, and they're really subject to a rock chip screwing them up. And uh, these look good. They're bright. Um, only the very, very most discerning concourse judge would really know the difference. So, yeah, these are going to go on the car. Last part of the puzzle is this trim rim that'll cover up everything. It's firmly attached to the body while the headlight would move inside of it here. Now, if I've done my homework right, this spear here should line up with this accent. Let's see if that happens. It just clips in the top, then at the bottom here, there's this special bolt. I think it's a BA thread 
cheese head slotted that goes in the bottom here. That's what that tab's for down there. Okay, I adjusted that headlight out and I seated the chrome down firmly to the body. What do you guys think? Look at that J light in there. I think it looks fantastic. And am I lining up here? The spear, yep, that's pretty close. That's good enough. So I don't have to take this all apart and readjust that spear, which is really nice. It's a real elegant shape. The whole headlight pod, it really extends really deep halfway into the fender. And the chrome trim rim here it really accents that line. There's a lot of elegance going on here. Yeah, I love it. All right, next up, I wanna fit the rear shock absorbers. I really like these Coney shock absorbers. Really high-end units, adjustable, made in the Netherlands, I think, made in Holland, yeah. So this is kind of my preferred shock absorber for almost anything I do. Now, I couldn't install these on the bare chassis. There just wasn't enough weight to reach both the upper and lower mount. So now with the body fitted, we got the compliance, we'll be able to put them on the car. But to my surprise, Coney actually supplied us with these little struts. Or here's one right here. This, this is a strut. I couldn't believe this came with the shock absorber and instructions on how to reinforce the mount, the L bracket here. So the lower mount's an L bracket and Coney have sold us a strut to put on there, kind of a gusset to stop this from bending. And I think it's a good idea. So let's head over to Jetstream and Jason's gonna weld these up for us. All right, everybody, we're back here at Jetstream. Yeah. This is Jason. How you guys doing? He painted the XK150, and he's going to help us with these rear shock links. So, he... I guess the uh, Coney kit came with these uh, extra... Uh, gussets. Got? Gussets. There we go. Thank you. But uh, upon installation and looking at them, our gusset angles are a little out, and some of these guys are a little bent from uh, overuse. So, we're going to pop them in the press. Make them a little flatter, and then we'll uh, go over, grind them, and fit them, and weld them. Let's see how this goes. Right so on. Let's see what the, uh, we can do. Oops. We're alive. Okay. So we're going to uh, put this guy in the press and uh, bend him straight. Put him in the V-block here. Get him lined up. Push that down. Eyeball everything. Maybe push it over a little more. And doesn't take much. It's 50 tons, so so that's in there, and then we're gonna. Uh... You want to get in there? Sweet. A little bit straighter. Yeah, great. So let's go with that. Yeah. Okay. The goggles fogging up on me already. Okay, so we're gonna correct this. Uh... The gaps there, we're just gonna take a little bit off of these guys, grind them down, make them fit a little bit nicer and tighter before we weld them. So we're gonna go step back over here to the old. Uh... Getting the ground on the piece. I'm gonna it down. Got a big miller here. Big Miller. Argon? Uh, actually, it's Argon CO2 mix. Argon CO2 mix. There's a little mix welder time. You know what? Let's do some gloves. Safety first. Yeah, yeah right? there you go. You know, set a good example. There, and then we're gonna burn them in. Full there send, is. full, turn, cranking it up. We're gonna crank it up a notch, and full send. Here we go. Boom, that's nice. Look at that, guys, holy. Send it again, eyes, yep. First one there. Wow, look at those welds. Good job, man. Beauty. Love that. Just cleaned them up there, ready for paint. And you're going back on the car pretty soon. 
All right, we're all curious, Jay, what you got going on here. There's a lot to look at. Well, take a look. We got uh, one, two, three Heelys up on the wall. Wow. You can see through the plastic there. We got uh, five on the go in the shop right now. And right to my uh, right here, we got an XK120, big 10 coupe. We're rebuilding the, uh, the structure at the back there. The shut the panel? Door. Shut panel. Right. Yeah, wow, awesome. And uh, working on the rest. It's of the it. early split window there, eh? With the. Yeah, wow. Down to bare metal here. And the headlight pods are off. Yeah, we gotta fix the rust holes underneath the headlights. That's a pretty common area. Pretty much everyone's rust out there. Yikes. So, yeah. And what's okay. this here? This pre-war. Yeah, 38 Aston uh, Martin 1598. So uh, oh, yeah, you can see a picture of it right there on the wall for inspiration. Like, we're going blue. But, blue? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, what's going on here? Electric car, maybe? I don't know. I think we just, we got a really big generator in the middle. Look at that. Holy, so, going electric. Uh, yeah, going electric. Stay tuned. And the last three here. Wow, look at that Ace. Ace, Ace. Uh, I was waiting on an engine part so we can finish the engine off. And we got the uh, BM4 Austin Healy. That's on uh, assembly right now. We've got the engine just around the corner ready for paint. And then here's a BJ8 that uh, just came in yesterday. And we are doing the teardown and full resto on because it needs it. It's pretty rough uh, here and there, right? So stay tuned for this one. It should be pretty neat. Awesome, uh, awesome. But, uh, more. More. You know? Oh, look at this. There's a uh, tri-carb uh, Austin Healy that we're uh, doing the full resto on. So um, this guy's right about ready to have the body put back on and paint. You know, engine, gearbox, everything's rebuilt. Everything's brand new or refurbished, you know? Yeah, it looks uh, great. So it's coming along. Yeah, so you assemble the whole thing first and then the outer body panels then go the on. Outer body panels. Then it gets painted. Very got, interesting. Right? It's a little bit of an efficient way to do it, right? So. Yeah. And got a Mark II Tiger over here. Mark II. Wow, that's yeah. rare. So. Awesome. Well, lots going on here, Jay. Thanks for the quick tour. No problem. Nice to see what's happening, you know? Okay, let's get these brackets on the rear axle here. They actually hold the U bolts which holds the axle to the spring. Okay, let's put the shock absorber in. I got it at full extension and it'll just reach. I'm gonna first put it in the gusset at the top here. It's rubber mounted. The first small bush in the bottom here. And look at that, it's just gonna reach. Actually, isn't gonna reach. <laughs> I'm gonna need to put some weight under the axle, get this thing uh, positioned a little better. That should do it. Okay, there we are. Yeah, real nice of Jaguar to put this access panel in. It gives us access to the gusset there that holds the top of the shock absorber and makes the job of putting a double nut on there a lot easier. Okay, the last step here, it's kind of tricky. You have to put in the last bushing and there's a hole here for a cotter pin. You need to squeeze this whole thing together with this washer and get this cotter pin in. There's no real easy way to do that. So me and my dad, we made this tool here out of some vice grips and it'll pinch it together so we can get that cotter in. Come on. There it is. Really happy to see the Coney's in there. Really nice high-end unit. And got that washer and cotter pin in down there with our tool. My dad says if anybody needs to borrow it, just give us a call. And yeah, pretty nice to see a car from 1957 utilizing uh, shock absorbers. Even if the L-bracket here was slightly under-engineered, I think now with that gusset, we got a good solution going on here. All right, that's it for this episode. 
Bit of a mixed bag there, starting off with that engine and that beautiful crankshaft. And we'll get back onto it once the sprocket arrives, maybe in episode 10 there. And we fooled around with those headlight pods and the headlights. What do you think of those little drain holes I put in there? And how about Jason in his shop there with all those wonderful cars helping us out welding those telescopic shock absorber brackets? Yeah, pretty neat. All right, well, that does it for this episode. As usual, if you have any tips, tricks, comments, or trade secrets, I love to hear from you in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye.